Hi, everyone. I'll start with a very brief uh, summary of what we said last time uh, so that we can uh, easily uh, transition into what we want to talk this time, which is the security of blockchain. So we talked about hashes. Uh, we said that the hashing function is a function that takes data of arbitrary length, could be, uh, for example, a blockchain transaction or a blockchain block, and produces a digest of a specific size. And we talked about one of those hashing functions that we like to use is SA256. Then we talked about blocks. We said that blocks are in a blockchain, the way that we uh, are describing it is a, a sets of uh, uh, transactions from one person to another. And these are grouped into different uh, records, different blocks, and one block uh, comes after another and each block is pointing to the previous one. Then, in order for us to simplify a little bit the visuals, we, we encapsulated all this valuable information into the under the word uh, data uh, so that we can emphasize that what's really what makes a blockchain a blockchain is that uh, you chain uh, those data together uh, with a hash to the previous block and the hash of uh, the current block. And that hash is essentially uh, a concatenating the data with a nonce, which nonce is a number that uh, the, the node that is producing the block is able to uh, change arbitrarily. And they actually are changing it thousands of times or millions of times per second until they find a, a hash that makes the block valid. And that was defined as a hash that is uh, that starts with a lot of zeros. And that's because it's pretty unlikely to find a hash uh, that starts a lot of zeros. This essentially creates a decentralized lottery where a lot of different uh, miners, a lot of different nodes are all trying different nonces. It's like playing in a lottery, trying different nonces until one of them every 10 minutes wins the lottery by finding a hash that produces a block that uh, starts with uh, many zeros. So, then we talked about uh, blockchains. And we said that uh, essentially each block uh, is uh, um, chained to the previous block by making a copy, by, by uh, storing a copy of the previous block's hash into the current block. That's how it is, uh, it, this uh, chaining is achieved. And we sp spoke about two specific uh, things that Bitcoin is introducing. Uh, one is it, it is the difficulty or the difficulty target, which is a number that the higher this number is, the more zeros are required uh, for a block to be considered valid. And uh, the purpose of this is that uh, if people's hashing rate increases, that means that uh, normally uh, miners would be able to find randomly a next block in less than 10 minutes. So what Bitcoin does is it every 2016 blocks, which is roughly, roughly every two weeks, it computes how many minutes did it take on average for a block to be, um, to be uh, found in the past two weeks. And if that number was uh, uh, higher than, uh, two, um, than 10 minutes, then it uh, reduces the difficulty. If it's lower, it increases the difficulty. And we talked about how difficulty currently is in the order of uh, uh, 20 trillions. And these are the number of zeros that we need right now, 19. We also talked about the concept of a Coinbase. So every block uh, is uh, uh, um, coupled with a, an arbit with a transaction that is uh, producing new Bitcoin out of thin air and it's giving it to whoever the miner decided to give it. And the customer here is that the miner would give it to themselves or to a wallet that they control. Uh, and in cases where we have mining pools, um, a lot of different uh, uh, miners coming together, uh, they all agree on some uh, central, some, some, some central uh, let's say, wallet uh, address of the mining pool that uh, they, they all want to send. Uh, if they find the block, they send the block there, and uh, by sending send the Coinbase there, and by sending it there, then they split the uh, the, the reward. 
Then we looked at uh, the data of uh, a specific block that was produced uh, last week. Uh, as you can see, this, uh, this has a number. It's, uh, it starts with several zeros. Uh, an important thing we pointed out is that we don't even know who the miner was. And uh, today we're going to talk about how come we can trust uh, my, uh, people we don't even know uh, uh, handling our financial transactions and our financial uh, uh, assets. Uh, this is the difficulty of that block. This is the nonce that this block had. And uh, the miners made uh, 6.25 uh, Bitcoin because of the Coinbase, but they also made an additional one uh, uh, Bitcoin from fee rewards. Uh, these are uh, tips that uh, transactions included in, in in the um, um, when uh, so that they can guarantee that the uh, they will take place uh, faster than other transactions if there's congestion on the network. Uh, two quick graphs that we looked at uh, last week was uh, that the Coinbase is halving every uh, roughly four years. Now it started at 50 Bitcoin per block, and now we're at 6.25 Bitcoin per block, and it's uh, going to. Uh, get to zero uh, in, uh, what's that, about 100 years. Uh, now, the other thing uh, that we looked at is the total uh, hashes that uh, all the miners of uh, Bitcoin are producing um, are, are producing every second. And uh, this number uh, keeps increasing. It usually has to do with uh, the amount of interest uh, that uh, miners have to uh, uh, to do this, and also obviously, it also um, it depends on uh, the hardware. So in the beginning, we were having just uh, uh, simple computers mining, and now we have very customized uh, microchips that are uh, specifically doing uh, SATO fifty six uh, um, uh, computations all day long. Uh, and this is the, the difficulty, which is a graph that is basically following the, the hashing uh, rate, because uh, the higher the hashing rate, Bitcoin is increasing the difficulty so that it can stay st stable at about 10, uh, 10 minutes per block. Okay, so this is the high level of what we did last uh, week. And uh, now I want to start talking about uh, why, do, why can we trust all this stuff? And uh, primarily, I will talk about, about it in the sense of the following four elements. So the first one is uh, an enabling factor of technology, which is uh, public-private key cryptography. So this is the reason why we can be sure that we and only we can authorize transactions that are coming out of our uh, accounts. Then we're going to talk about... Uh, how difficult is it to actually break the underlying crypto, uh, the hashing functions, the public-private public, public, public private key cryptography, et cetera. And then we're going to see what Bitcoin is doing in terms of uh, how does it recognize what is the, what is the official chain. Um, it's, there is a rule called the heaviest chain rule that uh, uh, takes care of forks. And finally, uh, if all this fails, uh, there is uh, economic incentives, crypto economics, they call them, that uh, uh, help strengthen the security of blockchain. People have uh, uh, interests to actually not break stuff. But having said this, let's uh, begin with uh, uh, public-private key cryptography. Right. So why is this uh, needed? Um, like I said, in the previous uh, class, we were able to just write Alice sent to Bob three Bitcoin. We just wrote it there in the data field of the block. Uh, but uh, there's no guarantee that uh, uh, Alice is the one who is actually sending those funds over to Bob. Uh, and that's what I mean in this slide by saying, this is as good as garbage, our design, because uh, anyone could go and change and say, OK, Alice, uh, send me funds. And Alice can say, no, 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 I didn't. So as I said, this is uh, cryptographic signatures is the, is the key here. So let's talk about cryptographic signatures. In the physical world, piece of papers, a person's signature is the same everywhere. 
or at least it doesn't depend on the document the person is signing. It just depends on the person signing the document. So uh, uh, I, my signature would look uh, the same regardless of whether I'm signing this document or another document. Someone could even uh, try to forge it or copy paste it if it's a PDF and, uh, and then pretend uh, that I authorized a certain document. But uh, there's a, an invention here that in the digital world, in the cryptographic signatures world, the signature is actually a function of the message itself. So if I am signing a contract, then, then my signature is specific to this contract. And let's see how this works. It works as follows. The, there is a concept of a secret, public key, private key. Uh, I will be calling it a uh, secret key rather than private key because it starts with an S and we, if we have the concept of a public key which, which starts with a P. So I wanna have different, uh, different initial uh, consonant. Um, so we have a, a, a key pair, we have a secret key and a public key that uh, belongs to a person or is generated by a person. And then there is the, the algorithm, the cryptographic signatures algorithm, which contains two, two functions. It contains the signing function and the verifying function. So let's look at what the signing function does. The signing function gets the private key, the secret key of the signer, and a message, and produces a signature. So the message now could be something like, uh, uh, I authorize this person to get X amount of Bitcoin from my account. Um, now, there's the other function, the verify function gets the public key of that person, gets the message and the signature and responds with a true or false of whether the signature is valid for this specific message. So as you can see, the, the secret key always stays secret with the person who is authorizing something. And the public key can be public. Anyone can know about it. The message can also be uh, public. Like for example, on the blockchain, the blockchains are public, most public blockchains have completely public data so that you can see that uh, a transaction happened or not. So it's right there. And they also include the signatures. It's also right there. And the public key is also um, can be uh, uh, right there or uh, claimed by by the, the owner. The interesting thing that I was saying the other day, a previous lecture about this public keys is that only the person who has the private key can um, uh, produce signatures from that, um, from, from the public key of the corresponding private key. Let's look at this in uh, practice. I, li I like this visual um, open source, uh, uh, software that allows us to um, see this in practice. So let's say we we created a public key, a, a private key. Here is a private key in uh, um, that was created randomly. I can click create different ones, and uh, this these are the corresponding uh, public keys. Uh, so now I could also, in this case, as a seed, uh, I could use uh, uh, a number I want and I'm getting a public key. I'll just use a very simple private key here so that uh, we can remember, uh, remember it later. And how do I sign different messages? Let's look at this. So let's say um, I have a message, A sends to B, one Bitcoin. Here's a private key. Uh, don't worry about the fact that we're still uh, talking, uh, referring to Alice as Alice, uh, I'm just, building this up for you. You will see soon it's not gonna be A sending to B. Uh, but uh, uh, this is the sign. This is a visualization of the signing function. So sign, you get a me you, you give it a message as an argument. You give it a private key. You, and the result of your press sign is a message signature, okay? Uh, the message can be public. The signature can be public. This is private key. It shouldn't be public. No one should know about it. Now we have the verify function. So if we copy this data and paste it over to the verify function and we have the same message, we have the public key of the signer and the signature of, of those two. And then we, when, you click, when we click verify, we will see that this tells us that uh, it's green. So it is verified. Yes, it's correct. So if anyone came here and said, no, actually the message was two Bitcoin, uh, I changed my mind uh, of what I want to receive. 
then that doesn't verify. And uh, this is pretty much all the magic. Um, and uh, if you change this back to one Bitcoin, it verifies, or if you try to change the public key, it doesn't verify, or if you try to change the, the signature, it doesn't verify. And, and pretty much anything you touch here, it's gonna stop saying this is a valid uh, uh, signature. Uh, and because there's a lot of jargon uh, out there, uh, in case you uh, you hear it uh, uh, in, or, or read it in blogs, here are three uh, known secure signing function uh, algorithms: RSA signatures, that is used uh, usually on web and SSH. Uh, there is something else called something else called uh, ECDSA, that's based on an algorithm uh, that's uh, using elliptic curves, and there is another one called ED. 25519. Uh, All right. So I, I just said that we are using, we were just using Alice again, but uh, there is no need actually to be using Alice and Bob as the senders and the receivers. Um, because then in this case, we would actually need to have a a functionality of looking up what what is Alice's public key so that we can validate stuff. So what we can actually do is we can use Alice's public key rather than calling her Alice, and uh, and then we can uh, we can just call that public key a wallet address, it's like the username that you want to send uh, uh, funds to, and we're done. So then we are, have the concept of sending from one public key. Bitcoin to another public key. And that uh, is a complete uh, uh, system. And we don't need to associate it with anyone, with anything uh, else. And plus it makes, uh, it, it's a, it makes an interesting um, uh, property of creating the pseudo anonymous uh, um, uh, behavior on a blockchain. So you can see how the funds transfer from one account to another, but you don't really directly know who's the owner of each uh, account or address or public key uh, until one of them somehow uh, connects their activity with the real world, in which case you can start tracing back who, who was who. Uh, and that's how they have, uh, uh, over the years, uh, researchers been able to de-anonymize uh, a lot of uh, historical uh, Bitcoin transactions. But uh, but anyways, the, the, the primary motivation initially here was that to make the, sim the system simple, we don't even need to have uh, names or usernames or other things. We can just be using the public keys as the addressing system for this, uh, uh, for transactions to happen. And in fact, uh, in some blockchains, it's actually advised for people to use even a different key pair, like public private key for every single transaction and let the wallet handle the fact that they have multiple key pairs. So now let's look at how this uh, looks in our uh, system over here. Uh, we're not looking at the block, we're looking at a specific transaction. So let's say there were um, 20 Bitcoin that need to be transferred from Alice to Bob. We're not using Alice anymore. We're just using Alice's public key and Bob's public key. And th then we need to use Alice's private key to authorize this transaction. So let's do it. Here's the signature, the authorization of this transaction. And uh, Bob having the transaction, the public key of Alice, which is right here, and the signature can basically claim, claim the funds. And that's uh, how I can show this. This is the message. This is the public key of Alice. You click verify, it's all green. If Bob were to say that, no, Alice sent me 20 Bitcoin, 21 Bitcoin instead of 20, then uh, it wouldn't verify. And um, even if, if, uh, if Bob changed anything else, it, it would still not uh, verify as uh, I was saying. All right, so now let's look at uh, this, how it would look uh, all together. 
remember last time I was showing you these uh, these blocks here that uh, was initially being very simple. It had like a little data field, and then they started having Alice and Bob sending stuff. So now they're a little more complex. So there is a there is still the number of blocks. There's still a nonce. There's still a Coinbase. Now the Coinbase though is not going to a Bob or an Alice. It's going to a, to the public key that this uh, peer has uh, has chosen, and uh, or this node or this miner. Uh, and uh, there's a list of transactions, each of which uh, is signed by the public from the, using the, the private key of this public key over here. Um, and if we changed anything, it would make the block uh, invalid. <laughs> uh, there's a concept that I can talk about uh, later, uh, which is uh, for uh, optimization reasons, the actual header of the block doesn't need to actually include all the stuff that I was, uh, I was showing you right here. Uh, it could include only a hash of all this stuff and then store all this stuff in a public location somewhere else. Uh, and not as part of the core system that is maintaining the, the whole uh, chain of the blocks. Uh, and, um, and this is the field uh, right here, the Merkle root. It's, uh, it's a hash, of, it's effectively a hash of all the data, uh, of all the transactions that are held in each block. And this way you can end up with a block that, uh, that has uh, only, uh, it's only 80 bytes, 80 bytes, not even like the block header is only 80, 80 bytes, whereas all the data that could be stored on a on a block could be up to one megabyte, which is a million times bigger than 80 bytes or 100,000 times bigger than 80 bytes. Now, what have we said so far? So, so far, we've said that we've made, we've shown how Bitcoin becomes an immutable blockchain. Uh, and that's because every block, uh, oops, every block includes uh, a hash of the prior block, so it's immutable. It can, if you change anything, then you can tell. Uh, then it, uh, we've said that every block must be valid, and that may, to make it valid, we need to change. We need to have a proper nonce such that the block's hash starts with enough zeros according to some properties and values. And what we just showed now is that also every transaction must be valid. So what makes a transaction valid is basically two things. One that we talked and one we didn't talk about. Uh, the first one is that it is it has a, a validating a correct signature by the from address of every transaction, and which proves that the owner of that address is intended make the, to make this transaction. And the second one uh, is that uh, the trans the the owner who was making the transaction actually had enough funds to make this transaction. And, and I'm making um, a little bit of a leap here saying having enough funds because uh, um, Bitcoin is not exactly um, following the same uh, paradigm as, as accounts. It's something that is called uh, uh, unspent transaction outputs, which we can talk later today if we have time. Uh, but, uh, but let's basically simplify this to saying if the person's account has enough funds, then the transaction is possible. If the person's account is, doesn't have enough funds, then the transaction is not possible. And it's up to the miner to uh, basically uh, scan through the whole uh, history of the blockchain, or usually they maintain it in better data structures in their memory of what is a valid uh, UTXO or what is a valid uh, transact, um, whether the transaction is funded properly. And uh, that, uh, um, and, and then that makes them um, basically approve uh, to keep this transaction. And the nodes have an incentive to actually make sure that every transaction they, they put in a block uh, is valid, because if it's not, then when they send that block to other nodes, if they succeed in finding the right nonce, the other nodes are going to say, mm -mm, sorry, this block doesn't look like a valid block because it has this invalid transaction inside. So we're dis disregarding this. We're going to keep mining this block until we find the actual valid block. So now we talked about how public and private keys make uh, transactions something that we can trust, but we didn't say how, um, how secure are they in a way? Can someone, uh, are they like a password and someone can just guess that password? And if uh, someone guessed your password, then uh, uh, they will have access to your. They will. They can pretend that uh, you are 
you are, they are you and they can uh, find essentially your private key and uh, and impersonate you. Let's look at um, hashing functions because signatures, signing all these signatures uh, essentially depend on hashing functions because the whole signing and, uh, and verifying algorithm has multiple steps, but uh, some of these steps include hashing. So, so that's where a, a big bottleneck uh, of uh, cracking this whole thing would, uh, would, be, would be on, like uh, cracking a hashing function. So that's why we're talking about hashing functions, even though the, the bigger uh, picture is uh, cracking a signature. So like we said, the hashing function, data of arbitrary length uh, is producing a digest of a specific size. And we looked at one of those. And uh, now I wanted to talk to you about what would it mean to hack, crack uh, such hashing function. It's uh, um, the, the most uh, obvious um, attack is you have a hash, you have a initial data, and then you want to say, okay, I want to change this data to something else that, um, that actually was a question last, uh, last class. And, um, and then I want to pretend that something else happened instead. And then this other uh, something else would have the same hash. Um, this is possible. And actually, this is even more difficult than what I'm trying to, ex to, to describe here. Something, an easier, even easier problem to, 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 uh, to describe here is not this specific case, but finding any two, uh, data one, data two, that actually have the same hash. And we know that such collisions exist because since the, the resulting uh, hash is of specific size, any message that is bigger than that size, the, since this, the space is unlimited, you can find two messages that have the same hash. We know they exist theoretically, but how difficult is it to find them? Now, the other thing that I want to define here is that a hashing function is collision resistant or like cryptographically secure, as we say, if it is very hard for that function to find collisions. And one such function is SATO56, what's you, what uh, Bitcoin is using. The, the outputs, uh, the, the SATO56 has is, uh, are 256 bits, which if you represent it with visual uh, hexadecimal digits like this, it's 64 hexadecimal digits. This is an example of a hash of a SATO56. Bitcoin is actually using SATO56 of SATO56. So it takes the message, gets the hash and gets the hash one more time. Um, and uh, Ethereum is using another thing that's called the SA3, but um, uh, despite the fact that it is uh, newer, it doesn't make uh, SATO56 any less secure as we will see right now. So now let's try to, we haven't found an algorithm as a, um, as a human race so far. We haven't found an algorithm that is uh, uh, in a smart way, uh, cracking SATO56. So the only way that we, we, we are able to know is the brute forcing, basically trying different uh, uh, hashes until we find the collision that we want. Now, how many hashes do we need to try before we find a collision? So we said it's 256 bits. And uh, because in this case, uh, um, we don't, even care about finding a collision of a specific predetermined uh, of specific predetermined uh, values, we only need to find any collision. Uh, in the same way that it's a similar problem is uh, you are in a classroom right here. Uh, what is the probability that two students have exactly the same birthday? This is an easier problem than saying what is the probability of my someone else has the same birthday as me. So. Uh, so in this case, I'm just uh, basically trying to say that even though we have 256 bits, the, the, to attack the problem here, we would need to compute two, two, 2 to the power of 128 hashes, which is less than 2 to the power of 256 hashes, which would be extremely bigger, much bigger. And because we, we don't uh, talk binary in, uh, usually we don't have a feeling about binary, I'm going to translate all the numbers to decimal. So this is about 10 to the power of 38 hashes. That's a pretty big number. It's not even nowhere near to what we were talking about, the hashing rate that was uh, millions of tera hashes per second. So that's why I'm just going to leave it at as 10 to the power of 38. And um, now, as we saw earlier, 
all Bit no no Bitcoin nodes together are currently computing 140 exahashes per second. So this I will see how many exahashes per second or hashes per per year we would have. So 140 times 10 to the power of 18 times 86,000 seconds per day times 365 days per year. That gives us 10 to the power of 27 hashes per year. Okay, so at this rate, this would take 100 billion years to find one um, collision on Saturn 56. So how did I find this? 10 to the 38 divided by 10 to the 27, that's 10 to 11, which is 100 billion years. So that's how hard it is to, for us to find a single collision, not yet to basically say impersonate Alice. So that would be even more difficult impersonating Alice specifically, but uh, uh, even finding. So we, we haven't found any collision on Saturn 56. We know they exist. If you find one, you will be extremely famous. Uh, and to put this even in perspective, because 100 billion years sounds like a lot of years, but uh, our entire universe is about 13 billion years old. So that means that uh, it would need to take today's miners, all the miners in the world, if they stopped mining Bitcoin and started trying to uh, attack one hash of uh, Shadow 56, it would take them uh, seven times the entire lifespan of our uni universe before they can find a, a hash. Whoa, that sounds pretty darn uh, secure, right? Well, there's other uh, potential um, problems that could possibly happen here. So what if we have stored our secret key on our computer in plain text and we get a virus and that virus is looking for Bitcoin uh, uh, private keys and it finds our Bitcoin secret key and it steals it, sends it to an attacker. This is not going to take, you know, seven universe lifespans. It's going to be much simpler. That's why uh, here, relying on the cryptography and cryptographic uh, um, properties is actually pretty good, but we also need good interfaces to make sure that people are using it the right way and they are not uh, um, uh, trapping yourself into uh, uh, much bigger uh, problems than uh, um, what... Um, the securities uh, and cryptography cryptography is uh, is giving you so now let's look at uh, the next uh, topic which is uh, uh, something uh, an additional point as i said uh, different uh, cryptocurrencies have um, Oops, it's jumping. Uh, dif different cryptocurrencies, let me not uh, open it yet. Uh, different cryptocurrencies place emphasis in different uh, properties. So uh, in, um, there are two, there are three, there is an old uh, computer science uh, uh, theorem that has been uh, proven that uh, in fault tolerant distributed systems, you can only have uh, um, two out of three properties. One of the properties is whether you have fault tolerance or not, but we need this because we're building a blockchain, so we can't give up on that. And the other two properties is safety and liveness. Uh, safety essentially means uh, whether your transactions can be reverted or not, whether you can have forks, whether you can have uh, um, two parts of the distributed system that uh, may be on an inconsistent state. So one blockchain says, this transaction happened and one one says it didn't happen. That's safety. And the other one is liveness, which means that the blockchain, no matter what, will keep producing blocks or the distributed system will keep making steps in the future. So there are different cryptocurrencies that take different stances. Bitcoin emphasizes liveness. It means that even if uh, uh, there's a network split, or even if there's a lot of computers that uh, all of a sudden go offline, um, then the blockchain will continue producing blocks. Uh, in other cryptocurrencies, uh, this is uh, they emphasize uh, the safety, which is if there is a giant network split or some other uh, weird uh, uh, thing, then uh, the nodes are going to stop producing blocks because there is a possibility that if they produced a block, they didn't have enough confirmations from all other nodes. There's a possibility that this block might result into a fork. Um, so there's two, th two, two, um, two schools of thought here. And now I'm going to describe how the Bitcoin is solving um, the, the situation when forks happen, since we know that in Bitcoin, Bitcoin is violating um, um, safety. 
So the way this Bitcoin does it is by a longest valid chain rule or the heaviest chain. So um, essentially, if we have a fork, uh, uh, for some reason, there was a block 50A that was after block 49 for some nodes and some for some other nodes, there was a 50 block and maybe they, they continued mining and they found a 51 and a 52. Then uh, when all the nodes, including the ones who decided that this block down here, uh, become aware of the entire chain, including the fork, they will all basically abandon any, any shorter uh, blockchains and they will all agree that uh, the, the official blockchain is the one that is the longest. And... Um, uh, and just to be 100% clear here, it's not really the longest, it's the heaviest. And by heaviest, I mean, each block has a weight. The weight is the D, that uh, difficulty. So, so you intuitively, you get the difficulty, you sum up the difficulty of all the blocks and, uh, and this blockchain has, is heavier than this blockchain. So you take this blockchain because someone what could uh, do is it could take a, uh, a really small difficulty here and produce a ton of blocks. And then the sum of all the difficulties here is actually smaller than the sum of, uh, than the difficulty over here. And it's not a sum, it's a, it's a diff different function, but simplifying it like that. And, uh, and then it would basically try to fool everyone to follow this blockchain when they actually produced it uh, with the smaller zeros, smaller number of zeros in the beginning. Uh, that's why uh, it, it is the heaviest, but visually we can look at it like that. So what we saw now, going back to the properties of our blockchain, I, we already talked about the first three. Every block includes a prior block's hash, making it immutable. Every block must be valid because the nonce should have enough uh, zeros according to the current uh, state of the blockchain. And uh, every transaction must be valid because it, has, it must have a valid signature. It must be actually um, using funds that they exist. And, uh, and what we just said is that every block should be part of the blocks of the longest uh, chain. And this is what makes our uh, whole blockchain, it closes the loop in a way that makes all the properties that we wanted to have uh, uh, in Bitcoin. Now, let's look at uh, one more thing, economic incentives. Uh, so there's a lot of different attacks that you can uh, put do on on Bitcoin. Um, none of them is uh, is considered to be uh, you know catastrophic since Bitcoin is working. But uh, there's solutions like uh, mitigations for each one. But I will tell you about one that's uh, that's pretty pretty important, and how the economic incentives uh, is uh, fixing it. So so the fifty one percent attack. So uh, if you want, if you somehow had a mining pool or a single entity like that managed to be able to produce 51% of or more of um, the hashing power of every given second of, uh, of the whole collection of all miners of Bitcoin. That means that uh, this entity would be producing 51% blocks versus everyone else would be producing 49% of the blocks. That means that this entity could always be ignoring everybody else's blocks. So if there was a block 33 and then 30, someone found 34, and uh, this is the this bottom uh, row is the, um, is the one that, um, that the, is the attacker here. And then what the attacker could say is like, oh, you found 34, don't worry, I will keep uh, uh, mining uh, 34, until I find one that is sending all the Coinbase to me instead of uh, sending it to you. And, and even if the rest of the world was able for a little bit to have a longest chain, on average, because they have more hashing power, this bottom chains out here uh, will always be slightly bigger than the one up here, making all these nodes constantly dropping their blocks, saying, ah, never mind. Actually, I'm not able, my, my, my block here or these blocks here are not part of the longest chain. This chain is longer. They will always be doing that eventually. And then it, this will be compounding the problem because every time the two, the two um, things uh, uh, become the bottom one, then the top will be starting from scratch again. 
uh, uh, and uh, this is going to cause a situation where this miner will be always not getting 51% of the um, of the um, uh, rewards of uh, Coinbase rewards of the blocks, but they will be getting 100% of the rewards. Plus, they could be always, for example, excluding someone else's transactions, doing uh, anything uh, anything they want, picking what transactions to to put inside. And if you want to hear more about uh, these various attacks, then uh, there's a class for this, uh, CS251. Now, what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto said early on in his prediction about Bitcoin was that uh, this actually could be protected if you look at the incentives of uh, people. So having someone gain 51% of the hashing power of the whole world that is, uh, that is uh, has, um, mining Bitcoin is a very expensive operation to, to have. So, so this entities, entity has an economic incentive to help make sure that uh, the system stays um, honest. The system uh, continues producing uh, blocks in a, um, in a non-malicious way, in non, no fraud uh, way. And, and that's because if they did another way, a different way, then uh, the world would uh, stop trusting Bitcoin, and they would feel like, wow, Bitcoin is just uh, uh, right now under attack. Why would we be using Bitcoin? And then they will start selling. They will start, it will start crashing. And therefore, it, this would undermine this person's uh, economic interest to um, participate in this whole system because they may be getting 100% of, of zero versus, uh, or of something much smaller than getting the 51% that otherwise they would be getting uh, if they were playing nice. And in fact, this was tested in uh, in practice. One of the early uh, days, uh, uh, mining pool ended up uh, becoming as big as uh, more than 50%. And uh, what they did is they actually started rejecting uh, uh, people who joined uh, that uh, pool so that uh, they can uh, um, uh, go below 51%. Uh, interestingly, that mining pool doesn't exist anymore, but uh, was very, very small. Um, so that's about Bitcoin. And uh, there's other ways that uh, economics or can, can come into play. So, so some blockchains like Bitcoin impose economic incentives that are extrinsic, uh, such as Coinbase and tips on the nodes to make sure that they play nice. Um, what we just, or the argument that we just uh, described. Um, but other blockchains actually opt to offer absolutely no incentives for nodes. So being a node on the system doesn't give you any tips, doesn't uh, give you any Coinbase, uh, nothing. So what ends up happening in these situations uh, is that the nodes who participate have an intrinsic interest to support the ecosystem. Like uh, who could have an intrinsic interest? Uh, like any entity that depends on a particular blockchain, let's say, someone built a decentralized application that uh, they want it to be running. They don't want the blockchain to crash. They, they want like a token that is running on top of a blockchain or, or a business that's running on top of a blockchain. In, in the Ethereum example, Ethereum is uh, currently using the, the extrinsic uh, motivations, but if Ethereum were using intrinsic motivations and it didn't have any uh, blockchain uh, uh, block rewards, then uh, think of a big token. There is a, a Tether. And Tether is running on top of Ethereum, and uh, there is $25 billion worth of Tether that are being exchanged that exist uh, on top of Ethereum. So, so Tether Inc., the company that is running USDT, uh, has a $25 billion incentive that Ethereum is running flawlessly. It's, it's fast, so they would be putting fast computers to make it run, and it is not um, doing any funny business where uh, like hacked code or weird things that uh, would be violating the cryptographic uh, uh, signatures and the cryptographic properties uh, in there. So that is another way of uh, showing uh, different kinds of uh, economic motivations that people can have and still play roles as uh, nodes uh, with intrinsic or with extrinsic uh, motivations. Okay, so now uh, let's get a little more uh, maybe philosophical. So uh, every innovation that we had in, uh, in the history was there because it filled a significant gap 
that uh, existed in, in the world. So to give you an example, um, for since the beginning of uh, our of humanity, we had a knowledge gap. So some people knew about something, but other people didn't. When something was happening in uh, uh, Europe, uh, people living in uh, the USA did not even know about that thing happening. And uh, people uh, did not even know that uh, USA existed, for example, or Americas existed, uh, for example. There's no USA uh, we're talking about thousands of years ago. Um, and then the printing press, which is basically newspaper, completely uh, filled that gap initially because it was very easy to uh, print newspapers, deliver the newspapers, the news travel. Then there was the engine that came along, which filled the power gap before the engine existed. The only thing we had for producing power was essentially humans and animals. And uh, it was all manual effort. And then uh, the engine came along and uh, filled that gap. And all of a sudden, we were able to accelerate our um, development much faster because we had those engines that were more, had more um, horsepower than any human. And uh, then there was, I want to point out the, the internet, which is uh, filling a lot the distance gap because since uh, forever, um, we it was it was difficult to um, hold a conversation or a class uh, uh, over the, you know, Pacific. Or, and and I bet today in this uh, classroom there may be some students that are actually living in uh, other countries right now because of COVID nineteen or even in a different uh, continent. And uh, the internet uh, uh, filled this gap. And I think you can guess where I'm getting with the next one. Um, I'm talking about trust. So what the blockchain, what the what gap blockchain is feeling here is the gap of uh, the having necessary trust to perform certain business transactions. So so traditionally, uh, you need to either trust the other party. You you have a friend. You promise that you will give him this in exchange for that you believe or they believe you that you will do what you say after they do what they say. They transfer the deed of their house, then you actually need to pay them. They, they trust it will happen. Or if they don't, then they both of you need to trust an intermediate party. There is an escrow. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then because we both trust that escrow, that if we send the funds to that uh, escrow company, the company is not going to take the funds and leave. And if you send your, your property's house, uh, the deed of your house to that company, they're not going to take it and run. They will instead swap it and give it back to the opposite uh, party. We need the trust if we want to have the credit companies or uh, the bank accounts, or they, they, need to, they, they need to trust that you will actually pay your debt at the end of, in the end of the day. All these things now, uh, all of a sudden, with blockchains and with uh, smart contracts, can uh, be part of the code. So they, you don't need any more uh, any intermediate parties for for certain things. Uh, that still in the digital world, but more and more things become uh, digital as we speak. Okay, so that was the last thing that I wanted to uh, specifically cover today. We are at a time, um, so anyone, it's uh, 10.50, so anyone who uh, it has another class and wants to and needs to go, you guys are uh, welcome to leave uh, uh, right now. That's the end of the class. But I will stay for a few more minutes until 11 for anyone who has questions and happy to answer uh, those questions. Uh, my, my background is computer science. Uh, I, I did my PhD at Stanford and then uh, uh, postdoc. My research interests was in uh, fault tolerant distributed systems. So when I, my first thesis was uh, a system that was uh, comparable to how smart contracts work on Ethereum uh, today. So um, uh, it was essentially in the same way abstracting all the uh, complexities of maintaining the fault tolerant uh, system under, underneath 
and making it making this completely abstracted and making it easy for people to essentially write a program that's running on top of a fault tolerant uh, distributed system without knowing all the specifics. And that's in the same way that smart contracts on Ethereum. Um, you don't need to know how Ethereum works or how like hashes work or anything. You just need to write a program in uh, uh, in the programming language and then upload it to the blockchain. And then after that, use it as if it was a server client application and you don't need to know anything about that. So that was uh, my first uh, kind of uh, inter research interest in my uh, my second research interest is in social computing and uh, 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 human computer interaction and um, how uh, and crowdsourcing and how can you um, help uh, people online, especially a lot of people online to get uh, aligned and achieve certain goals that they have, how to better do this and how to make the interfaces in a way that they are intuitive and, uh, and reliable and uh, they achieve the purpose that they need uh, to achieve. So. Uh, these days, I'm combining these two interests of mine into um, uh, looking into blockchains and how I, we can make them more, um, how we can uh, have a mass adoption and we can uh, bring them to where they, they deserve to go. <laughs> I think that every time there is a new technology that is uh, better than the previous technology, um, there is a lot of uh, parties that were the leaders or the of the previous technology that are being affected. And uh, um, some of them, they see that they, they, they need to adapt to continue being leaders and others, they just ignore it. Um, so I, I think, uh, what you mentioned, uh, they need to see and, and adapt. Uh, I, I can give you an example with digital cameras. Uh, uh, what was that? 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there was a, there, we started seeing those digital cameras that were not that great. Still film was, was better than, uh, than cameras because they were so highly pixelated. And there were these big uh, uh, camera companies and some of them ignored the problem. They said, ah, digital photography will never be as good Kodak, as film. Yeah. yeah, and they went out of business. And others, um, they, you know, uh, Canon, Nikon, uh, they um, embraced it. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, we are leaders here. We actually need to embrace the technology, start getting better and better at it. We should stay being leaders in our space. So, so now financial institutions and countries uh, could potentially see this either as a threat and try to stop it or ignore it. And others may see it as a, a, a challenge or a, a, an interesting evolution. And instead of trying to stop it, uh, they try to participate in it and uh, promote it and make it better for everyone. The technology has proven to always come and uh, become better and better when it needs uh, to be. Um, I'm not uh, sure here how much uh, Bitcoin is going to uh, evolve or it needs uh, to evolve. Uh, Bitcoin was uh, the first uh, currency that uh, essentially over the course of the last 10 plus years, it proved to the world that uh, uh, digital currencies, cryptocurrencies and blockchains uh, they are actually possible and not only possible that they can actually represent uh, um, economic value. Uh, so this by itself is huge. So now whether this is also the fact that Bitcoin was the first one and it wasn't, uh, it was, it is very simple. You see in a couple of lectures, we, we can pretty much describe 90% of it. And then the rest is uh, technical implementation details. Uh, that obviously makes it a little simplistic for certain uh, things or for certain uh, 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 situations that were not predicted by Satoshi uh, 10 plus years ago. Um, but in the end of the day, does it really matter? Um, what's important is that uh, now the world knows, knows something better and uh, <laughs> the world will adapt, whether it is by changing the code of Bitcoin, whether it is by changing our regulations, whether it is by changing our uh, mindsets or whether it is by creating new and different other coins that, uh, that make more sense uh, in 2021. Um, uh, the, 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 in the end of the day, 
what's important here is that uh, there is a new technology that has significant advantages. 